Derek Mahoney is a Sydney-based specialist orthodontist who has spoken to thousands of practitioners about the benefits of interceptive orthodontic treatment. After completing his dental degree at the University of Sydney, Dr Mahoney proceeded to the UK where he completed his master's degree in orthodontics. He's completed a diploma in orthodontics at the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh and also has passed the Royal College of Dentists in Canada postgraduate exam in orthodontics. Dr Mahoney has a postgraduate qualification in dentofacial orthopaedics from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow and has also attained his membership in orthodontics qualification from the Royal College of Surgeons in England. Dr Mahoney has been seeing an average of 250 patients per week for the last decade. He currently has over 3,000 orthodontic patients in active treatment and has been a keynote speaker at the International Orthodontic Summit meetings the International Association of Orthodontics Meetings and the American Association of Functional Orthodontics Meetings. Dr Mahoney approaches his orthodontic diagnosis from a facial profile point of view. He sets his treatment goals to create not just straight teeth but beautiful faces and healthy temporomandibular joints. Dr Mahoney is a contributing editor to the Journal of Clinical Pediatric Dentistry, the International Orthodontic Journal and Spanish Journal of Dentofacial Orthopaedics. So I'm just going to hand over to Dr Mahoney now. Just give me a minute to pass over. And Dr Mahoney, we should be seeing your screen in a minute. Okay. Yes. I can see your screen. Good evening, everybody. I am uh, presenting today on the uh, second part of early interceptive treatment. In the first seminar, I talked about creating space uh, in narrow pallets uh, to make room for possible impaction uh, or prevent possible impaction of canines. In this seminar, we're looking at even younger children uh, and in seminar one, I discussed the ideal age between seven and nine uh, to assess um, the bite and space requirements. In this seminar, I'm focusing on children even um, earlier uh, than age six, uh, and they are children who have um, habits that we need to break. And some of those habits include um, uh, pacifier use, uh, sucking the thumb or sucking uh, fingers, uh, tongue thrusts, um, etc. And so um, if people do have patients, uh, uh, cases or questions they want to ask me, uh, I'll leave this slide up which has my um, email address and uh, I'll be happy uh, if uh, questions arise and we don't have time to answer them, you could uh, send me an email. The other thing is um, I will be referring to some techniques such as fitting of an appliance called a thumb guard. Um, and another appliance uh, which is a fixed digit dissuader and videos on how to fit these appliances you can find uh, in YouTube if you subscribe to my uh, doctor only section for um, uh, YouTube. So let's get some facts uh, about uh, thumb sucking and dummies or pacifiers. Um, the sucking urge uh, is a normal physiological reflex and it's estimated that it occurs in uh, more than 90% of children on a regular um, basis. It's what we call non-nutritive sucking. But we also know that um, sucking habits um, are a lot more common in the Western world uh, than they are in developing countries and I will refer later in this seminar to research that was done by Dr. Weston Price in this regard. And what Price was saying is that um, in so-called primitive uh, populations where they don't have access to pacifiers or bottles or formula milk, uh, most children are breastfed in an upright position for two years. And uh, he went on to say that these children develop nice palates, uh, good airway and hardly any malocclusion. And then he contrasts that to children in Western society who tend to have a much higher incidence of habits uh, and he put this down to um, them not being breastfed for as long as they could and the parents having regular access to things such as pacifiers, uh, dummies, um, bottle 
uh, bottles, uh, formula milk, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, the first thing I think uh, we should uh, look at is the, when is the best time to break a habit. And when it comes to the eruption of the adult teeth, obviously we'd like to break these habits in children uh, by age six or seven. But when it comes to formation of the palate and formation of a normal swallowing pattern, uh, we actually would like to break these habits even earlier. So what that means is um, children who are accessibly using a pacifier you either try and break the pacifier habit or you give the child a pacifier which is not going to cause as much um, uh, damage to the dentition. And there's lots of orthodontic pacifiers on the market, but there's only really one that has proper evidence-based research to support it. And that is the Baby Nova pacifier developed in Germany by a Dr. Rolf Hins. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, later on in the seminar. But the bottom line is, if a child uses a pacifier, or sucks their thumb and fingers, or uses a bottle, they develop uh, a habit where the tongue is placed incorrectly and does not give the stimulation it needs to to the palate. So we end up with the palate um, being constricted, and we also end up with the tongue causing the teeth to procline in the upper arch, um, and we end up with the overactive lower lip uh, because we form a seal with the tip of the tongue and the lower lip. Medical practitioners know this as an infantile swallowing pattern. Uh, as dentists, uh, we know this normally as a tongue thrust. Um, if there's one book that I think summarizes this whole topic really well, it's this book by Dr. Eric Larsen, who's a retired professor of orthodontics in Sweden. And he simply called it breastfeeding, the suckling urge. And he talks about the development uh, of the dentition and how it could be negatively influenced by uh, these habits. Um, Eric Larsen was the head of the orthodontic uh, department um, uh, in Flodberg, Sweden. Uh, since 1980. I had met him when I was doing my studies at the Karolinska Institute uh, in Stockholm. And um, he had published quite widely uh, in the field. In fact, his PhD thesis was called Dummy and Finger Sucking Habits, uh, with special attention uh, to their significance for facial growth and on the occlusion. And since he completed his PhD, He's published more than 40 articles uh, in this field. Um, another leader in the field is a Professor Herman uh, Ramirez, who is the um, chairman of orthodontics in the University of Manitoba, and who teaches the whole concept of dentofacial orthopedics. He has a textbook entitled Early Interceptive Orthodontic Treatment. And I'll use this slide from his textbook, where he starts by saying, that prevention of malocclusions really can start from pregnancy. And what that means is if we can educate uh, mothers-to-be of the importance of proper breastfeeding, not using pacifiers, not reliance on um, bottles, um, then we can actually prevent a lot of the oral dysfunctions that tend to establish themselves during the first year of life. And this can directly or, or indirectly um, prevent some of the malocclusions that we see in young children. I mean, the bottom line uh, from the research um, from both of these clinicians is that breastfeeding is really the primary way to prevent malocclusions and also to avoid bad oral habits um, during infancy. And as I said, we look back at what Weston Price had done, and he was looking at these um, children in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, uh, Aboriginal tribes in Central uh, Australia, etc., and he realized that the mothers were not only breastfeeding for a longer period of time, but the correct position of the baby uh, during breastfeeding was apparent. Uh, and that uh, means that the, the baby should be seated on the mother's lap um, uh, with the body and the health, head uh, uh, tilted um, about 60 degrees, as opposed to what a lot of mothers tend to do, feed while they're uh, lying down. Uh, which does not encourage normal tongue uh, posture. So we're going to have a look at these two diagrams. You can see the diagram uh, on the right shows a baby uh, on the breast, uh, 
diagram on the left shows a baby with a bottle. Uh, it could be also a pacifier. And what we're seeing here is that with correct breastfeeding, that the baby uh, is able to breathe through the nose. They form a seal around the nipple and they swallow properly. But wrong breastfeeding um, or uh, bottle feeding, uh, the opposite happens. Uh, it allows for passage of air to occur through the mouth, which encourages a mouth breathing habit, and it reduces the activity of the, um, of the lip muscles. They don't form a seal. So therefore, the mandible tends to rotate downward and backward, encouraging more of an open bite. The tip of the tongue does not stimulate the development of the premaxilla, and from day one, you're starting to get um, a malocclusion development. Conversely, uh, if you're breastfeeding, uh, you're using your mandible uh, to catch the mother's nipple. And this, uh, what we call endochondral uh, ossification at the mandibular condocartilage, is encouraging normal class one growth because the forward and backward movement of the mandible to effectively milk the breast is increasing the um, muscle activity of the important muscles that stimulate mandibular growth, uh, in particularly uh, the lateral terebral. And in this study, they compared the muscles that are used in bottle feeding or when you have a orthodontic um, pacifier compared to breastfeeding. And I think you can see from this table that with uh, breastfeeding, uh, you, you stimulate much higher muscular activity in those muscles of mastication when compared to either a pacifier uh, or a bottle. And that higher muscular activity, which is stimulated by the breastfeeding, is permitting those muscles to develop and get them ready to destroy food uh, when the patient starts getting teeth and goes to a harder uh, uh, diet, but also uh, has important functions in the growth of the palate um, and uh, in the position of the tongue. So for many years, mothers have known the advantages of breastfeeding from an emotional and uh, nutritional and immunity point of view, but only recently has there been great research showing the uh, importance of breastfeeding, particularly in the first six months uh, of a baby's life when it pertains to stimulation of craniofacial growth and the um, uh, development through mandibular growth and muscular uh, development. So um, we would like to uh, educate our patients um, and our colleagues that breathing and swallowing patterns are, are programmed in the brain during the first year of age. So if babies are properly fed during that first uh, year, they're going to start normal tongue positioning, normal lip seal, and hence normal development of the palate. Other research to support this theory uh, comes from um, Brazil, and uh, in this paper published in the American Journal of Orthodontics and uh, Dental Fascial Orthopedics uh, 2010, um, they um, had looked at um, children who were breastfed versus those who weren't in regard to their incident of uh, crossbite. Um, the World Health Organization, for instance, uh, recommends uh, breastfeeding exclusively for the first six months of an infant's life. Um, Western Price noticed that if the child was breastfed up to two years, there was even better development of the palate. And um, uh, in this research uh, paper, uh, uh, which was uh, from research in the University of Sao Paulo, they examined a huge sample, 1,377 children, um, and the age range from three to six years. So what their conclusions were was those children who were breastfed exclusively for at least six months and um, those that were breastfed for greater than 12 months had much uh, better palate formation and did not have the posterior crossbite seen in some of the other children. Um, one of uh, the big researchers in this early deceptive orthodontic field is Dr. Marja Ospenovic, who um, is the president um, of the Slovenian Orthodontic Association and recently held uh, a big meeting as part of the European Orthodontic Society. Um, and she published a paper uh, back in 2009 also in the 
American Journal of Orthodontics, where she looked at incorrect uh, orofacial functions in young children. And again, uh, was linking this to the palate not being formed properly and the palate um, resulting in a cross bite. And uh, what she did, she assessed a number of factors. One was um, the, whether the child was breathing through the mouth or through the nose. And the theory there is if you breathe through your nose, your tongue rests on the palate, which stimulates um, the development, what we call intramembrous uh, ossification. And the second was in swallowing, if the patient had the tip of tongue behind the upper incisors, as opposed to the tongue going between the teeth, which is what we call a, um, a tongue thrust. And if you look at this table from that uh, paper, uh, you can see how she's looked at children from zero to uh, five, and she uh, maps the percentage of uh, what we call atypical swallowing uh, linked to bottle feeding, and uh, she matches thumb sucking habits and mouth breathing habits uh, to uh, pacifier use. And uh, what she's um, uh, saying is in children who had the unilateral crossbite, you can see a much higher incidence of these uh, unwanted um, uh, habits. So was it statistically significant? And the answer is yes. When you look at this figure four, that shows the percentage of children that had the irregular uh, oral functions, you can see that um, the crossbite group was much higher. That's the darker blue. Um, going back to the observations of two great anthropologists, uh, Dr. West and Dr. Phil Cooperman, um, didn't see these sorts of habits in young women um, in developing countries. And Western Price was a very interesting chat. He was just, but he basically, back in the early 30s, traveled worldwide, and he studied the diets as well as the uh, systemic and dental health. Um, of isolated primitive tribes. And he has a big following around the world when it comes to nutrition, but also um, a big following when it comes to development of malocclusions uh, based on diet and certain patterns. And um, what Western Price did, he realized that um, natural man, if we call it that, uh, had uh, on average two years of breastfeeding. Uh, he noticed they had a high immunity to dental decay because of the mother's milk. Uh, they had wide dental arches and fairly straight teeth, so a big absence of malocclusion, as well as better facial structure and uh, improved occlusion. And if you look at some of the diagrams from this textbook, um, you can see uh, uh, some of the uh, photographs uh, that he had taken as he traveled around the world of these big, broad uh, uh, arches. He then compared it to uh, children who were from the same tribes but were exposed to a Western diet. Uh, and then compared it uh, finally to children in a Western population. And what he noted when he looked at uh, so-called modern man, uh, they had a low immunity to dental decay because of the high sugar content of their diet. They had much narrower dental arches um, and more malocclusion, and he put that down to limited breastfeeding and increased use of pacifiers and, and, and bottles. Um, uh, and then we took photos of these uh, uh, children, uh, you could see the, uh, the malocclusion, the narrow arch, the crooked teeth, the underdevelopment of both the maxilla uh, and the mandible. And he really noticed that those children who uh, had limited breastfeeding had an increased uh, incidence of open bites and cross bites. So very similar research uh, to what I've already um, explained. So what can we do when we have a two-year-old, three-year-old who's still on a pacifier? Well, the first thing you do is to try and break the pacifier habit, and the child really should uh, go to uh, like a, a TP cup uh, as far as uh, the method of eating and drinking. But uh, many parents will still keep giving a pacifier so that the child um, goes to sleep and so that they really they don't get a headache. Um, so Dr. Rolf Hins, who was an orthodontist in Germany, uh, developed uh, a um, pacifier for this reason. I mean, he realized, as we all do, that suckling is a natural instinct and uh, it does give these children a calm feeling and satisfaction. They tend to do it uh, as they're about to fall off to sleep and sometimes subconsciously while they're sleeping. But the bad thing of um, thumb sucking um, and the use of um, pacifiers is that unlike natural breastfeeding, 
uh, the um, the tongue is pushed um, backward, and um, there's a high probability uh, for an open bite. And um, if you look at the average pacifier, um, they are sometimes used to avoid some sucking habits. But the problem is the standard pacifiers can be just as harmful uh, as uh, thumb or finger sucking if they're used too often. And in one of the papers he's published, he shows um, that uh, when he looked again at very young children, four-year-olds, uh, those who were using the pacifier, 70%, which is uh, a high percentage of the four-year-olds, had um, a, a malalignment of their teeth. And if you compare the child on the right diagram here, who is uh, not a um, pacifier user and has been breastfed for a longer period of time, you can see the lovely spacing between the teeth, which I say to parents is like money in the bank. If you have a young child in deciduous dentition who already has uh, crowding, um, they're definitely going to need orthodontics as they get older. Whereas um, if a child has spacing between the deciduous dentition, that's giving extra room for the adult teeth, which we know, with the exception of the second bicuspids, uh, to be much larger than their uh, deciduous precursors. Um, further studies uh, have varied this percentage uh, from as uh, low as 30 to as high as uh, 80%. And a lot of it has to do with the position of the tongue. When we swallow, the tongue uh, hits the palate, uh, sometimes with a force uh, of five to 600 grams. And um, that tongue is pressed against the front teeth uh, for six to 800 times a day in swallowing. So that pressure tends to keep that open bite permanent. And if the um, gap between that um, upper and lower incisor gets large enough, then you're going to start the tongue getting in there to effectively form a seal. It's what we call a tip of tongue to lower lip oral seal. So Dr. Higgins developed um, a pacifier, which um, in, depending on which country you're in can be called a baby nova, um, and, uh, or dentista. And the special feature of this pacifier is that it has an ultra-thin shaft. And that ultra-thin shaft basically minimizes the pressure on the teeth and the gum. It also allows a lot more space for the tongue because uh, the baglet uh, lies at the palate and it has a specially scooped uh, bottom uh, that leaves space for the tongue to be elevated, as opposed to a normal pacifier that's pushing the tongue uh, downward and forward, encouraging a, um, a tongue thrust. So children still get the um, comfort uh, of using this pacifier, um, but if you compare uh, the standard pacifier to the Dentistar, you can see that the uh, distance between those upper and lower incisors is um, uh, less than half, and as a result, less chance of open bite. Basically, the Dentistar comes in two sizes. You have a size one, which is uh, while the child has no teeth. And then since the eruption of the deciduous teeth, you go to uh, size two. And by then, you should be well and truly free of the pacifier. And what's interesting, when you look at the development of the palate, the palatine rugae section, uh, which is the hard front section of the, of the jaw, is the main point where the pacifier takes its effect. And yet this section, uh, tends to remain unchanged. is a very stable landmark in the palate uh, for a child after about three months of age. Yet when you look at pacifiers, there seems to be this uh, nonsense that uh, as the child gets older, you get a bigger pacifier. Um, and uh, that is actually encouraging worsening of the open bite and worsening of the tongue uh, uh, as uh, the child matures. So let's kind of review some guidelines for the um, use of uh, dummies or, or digi-sucking habits. And um, you can see from this paper that um, racial factors, uh, 80 to 90% of the children in the Western world tend to have sucking habits, which is uh, much higher than those, as we said, in the developing uh, countries. Uh, they also found that dummy sucking was more common in the lower socioeconomic uh, groups uh, within the Western world. Um, uh, and as far as what they thought is the cause of these problems, there's 
two basic theories. One, as we know, relates to an underlying emotional eye disturbance, and that's why the child um, in times of need will tend to put their uh, thumb in the mouth. But the other is that of a learned behaviour, in particular children who've never sucked their thumb until they go to kindergarten and see other children doing it and then and then start. Um, but um, we know 100% what the uh, negative effects of these habits are. Uh, when it comes to uh, dumbing and sucking, and we're talking about effects now in the deciduous uh, dentition, uh, we have a uh, open bite um, and um, we have a reduction in the maxillary arch width, which leads to the cross bite we, we looked at. And um, as far as digit sucking, which tends to sometimes take over after this prolonged pacifier use, you have the upper incisors procline, the open bite worsening, and that upper arch becoming even more narrow. And that tends to start affecting the teeth in the permanent um, dentition. Um, as far as the effect on the actual thumb, uh, obviously uh, it's in the mouth so long you can uh, get eczema and a uh, great way of uh, spreading um, some diseases such as um, uh, roundworm, uh, hepatic uh, gingivitis, uh, etc. So how can we prevent uh, these habits? I think the best thing to do uh, for young uh, children is trying to explain to them with uh, photographs what their teeth could like if they continued to uh, pursue sucking their thumb. But uh, what I'm going to go through in this lecture is uh, two methods of breaking uh, the uh, thumb or finger habit. One is the non-physical method, which involves a lot of um, explanation to both the parent and the child, and also reward systems. Uh, and lastly, what I call habit reversal, where we're going to give the child alternative activities, or alternative appliances, uh, when they have that uh, urge to, to suck their thumb. And then the physical methods are, are two things, basically a device called a thumb guard, which I will explain in, in a moment, um, uh, or uh, intraoral appliance. Now the intraoral appliance is a lot more effective uh, because it's fixed in, uh, and even if the child's doing this at night, um, uh, they won't be able to put, physically put their thumb in the mouth. But um, various parents have tried various techniques, and uh, the painting of um, noxious substances on the thumb really uh, hasn't been shown to be effective. And a lot of parents report to me they put chili uh, on their kid's um, thumb and the child uh, licked it off and then continued uh, to suck their thumb. And if anything, when the child gets older, it develops a, sort of a taste of spicy food. So we really want to get away from this whole concept of putting things on the uh, uh, thumb uh, that are bad tasting uh, or gloves, etc., and go to something that um, really breaks the oral vacuum. Um, so what are some of the problems that I see as an orthodontist that uh, arise uh, sort of as a result of this uh, chronic digit sucking habit? Well, the, the first thing is the crossbite. You have this narrow V-shaped upper arch, and that could result in a bilateral or at least a unilateral crossbite. The second thing is even if you break the habit, um, you're left with an open bite, so the tongue is getting in there. And uh, as a result, you have a tongue to lower lip swallowing pattern, which is called a tongue thrust, which makes the lower lip um, uh, overactive, causing a lot of dental crowding. You then have speech concerns, and uh, there has also been research to link this to um, high palates and uh, problems with nasal. This is one of the best papers that Eric uh, Larson had published, and it was published um, in the European Journal of Orthodontics in 1988. And what he talked about here was um, the treatment of children that were uh, using a pacifier for a long period of time or continue to suck their uh, fingers or, or, or thumb. Um, so what I like to do is take a photo of the kid actually doing the habit, and so I can see how severe it is, uh, meaning like this girl just does it uh, uh, on the um, anterior component of the thumb. Uh, other kids put it all the way back, um, uh, almost to the degree where the uh, other fingers are uh, causing separate deviation. And I'll show you a photograph of that in a minute. But I tell parents if they can stop this habit early, they're going to have less dramas with the teeth, uh, less uh, dramas with the speech and health, and um, overall um, uh, an easier habit to break if it's done um, earlier than later. And this is the kid who had actually deviated his septum 
by constantly sucking his thumb. And look at how his thumb is going fully in the mouth um, uh, as opposed to the last start there. Many years ago, Colgate, in conjunction with the Australian Orthodontic Society, put a brochure together which I found very informative, but unfortunately it's no longer uh, available. Um, um, but it was just simply called Thumb and Finger Sucking. And this little booklet, which was given away free of charge um, uh, at school, um, showed two great diagrams. The first diagram was of a child who was a chronic um, thumb sucker, showing the narrow palate, the crowded teeth, the open bite, and then showing uh, a child where the habit had stopped and the bite had corrected with some minor orthodontic correction. And I found this the most effective in children. I basically showed them the brochure and said, which um, teeth would you prefer? And of course they'd go for the teeth on the right, and that sort of um, uh, motivated them uh, to uh, break the habit. Um, now remember, this habit is, is normal in very young children because it is duplicating the feel of the nipple, and this is where the whole problem arises. Children who are not breastfed adequately, uh, who miss that feel of the nipple, tend to um, uh, start uh, thumb sucking. And um, I'm advocating a combined approach of a digit dissuader um, uh, with uh, possibly an appliance to redevelop the palate if the habit is continued and formed uh, the crossbite. In a very young child, um, you can treat the thumb habit through what's called counter conditioning. So this is a, a blue grass appliance, and all it means, and we, I use this a lot in an early mixed dentition. So uh, instead of sucking the thumb, uh, the, the patient uses their tongue to um, spin a Teflon roller, and without realizing it, they're actually retraining the tongue thrust. So the blue grass appliance works in two ways. It prevents the thumb from going uh, into the uh, mouth because uh, it breaks the seal. But the second thing is the patients feel they've acquired like a new toy, which is actually helping in the tongue position. And there's various versions of this. This is one that will give expansion uh, at the same time as changing tongue posture. Sure. These are, this appliance I'm showing is very uh, poorly designed uh, for three reasons. Number one, it's removable. So a kid is likely to take it out and put the thumb in. Number two, there's a lot of acrylic in the palate, and we're trying to encourage the tongue to go up on the palate as opposed to um, being pushed downward and forward. Uh, so all our appliance designs need to have sort of minimal bulk of acrylic in the palate. Um, now, these uh, appliances uh, look very horrific, and again, I don't advocate them because uh, they may break the thumb habit, but they uh, have an adverse effect on tongue posture. Um, so I still keep some of these on my mouthpiece to show kids to effectively scare them into uh, uh, not sucking their thumb because this is a real sort of uh, Hannibal Lecter looking type appliance. Um, uh, and the biggest problem with these appliances, uh, the good news is that they're fixed in, so we know they work. The bad news is is they encourage your abnormal tongue posture even if they break the habit. And the third thing is they don't allow for any expansion to occur. Uh, so we're going to talk about you know, what is the ideal appliance if you get to this kid who has developed a dental problem uh, already. Uh, this is a child who presents as a transfer case to my practice, and again, total waste of time. Uh, Mum reports to me that the uh, previous clinician had made this appliance, and all the child was doing is taking out their mouth and putting the thumb in. So uh, rule number one, fix the appliance in, do not make it removable. Rule number two, don't have acrylic that affects the tongue position. Uh, rule number three, have an appliance that will um, break the habit, retrain the tongue, but more importantly, encourage normal swallowing and normal tongue posture. When I take photo of kids sucking the, the thumb, I take a photo of the actual habit, like you see this little girl, but also actually of the digits, so you can see how chronic uh, that habit is. Um, the simplest method I have found to break a thumb sucking habit, if it's only occurring at night time, uh, is to put a bandage on the child's elbow. And I came up with this idea here after this young boy. Uh, he used to suck his thumb right till sort of, uh, age 10 or 11. And um, one day he broke his arm. And of course the parents were happy because um, they said, well, geez, well, one good thing about breaking the arm is the, the kid's not sucking his thumb anymore. So I thought, wow. Um, why, why don't we think about something to prevent the elbow from actually flexing? So what's been very effective for me to 
for the child who's doing this only at home and while they're sort of getting themselves to sleep is to put a bandage on the elbow uh, so that the kid can't actually bend the elbow and that prevents them putting the thumb in the mouth at night. Um, it's very rare to find an ambidextrous thumb sucker. So if you tend to break the habit uh, for the right hand uh, thumb sucker, they tend not to then start out on a tan. Now the other alternative uh, is, and this is for the kid who's doing it um, during the day as well, is a thing called a thumb guard. And, and, and what the thumb guard is, you can see from this diagram, it, it's a soft clear plastic tube that's worn over the thumb and it's held in place uh, by a hospital band. So uh, um, children go to school with it and they can wash their hands and they can write, uh, they can eat, etc. So it's, it's permanently placed there. And as far as the child is concerned, they're not embarrassed because it just looks as though they've broken their thumb. And it does not prevent the thumb uh, from going in the mouth, but the child doesn't get any comfort from it going in the mouth because it breaks the oral vacuum. So that's a very clever design. And it was designed by Eugene Zilba, who's the diagram is here, uh, who really was an engineer and had tried everything to stop his own kid from sucking the thumb, but eventually came up with this and, and had great success. Um, so uh, it's called a thumb guard in Australia, and you can get it from a company uh, called Preventive uh, Orthodontics. I think they have a, a, a web uh, a site. Um, uh, uh, in the US, it's called a T-Guard. And um, Gordon Christensen in his CRA group uh, did a study on this and showed a 90% success rate, which, which was great. Um, it was uh, difficult for the child to remove once placed. And um, it comes, uh, as I said, in different sizes based on the size of the kid's thumb. And some important notes to note about the, um, the tea guard, it should be put on during the times when the child is likely to engage in thumb sucking. Uh, and those times tend to be bedtime, naps, uh, when they're tired or stressed, uh, etc. That's if it's a random thumb sucker. But if, uh, if the kid's doing it night and day, at school, in the car, you know, if, uh, watching TV, then I would suggest you put it on full time. And um, the uh, instructions for fitting it are fairly easy. You insert uh, the plastic um, bracelet uh, into um, the retaining slot on the cylinder assembly, as you can see in diagram one. Then you engage the smaller slotted uh, flap of that clear cylinder, as you can see in diagram two. Uh, so then you're securing the bracelet around the wrist, as you see in diagram uh, three. And then your last step, a bit like a hospital bracelet, is simply to um, uh, uh, lock uh, that in, as you can see in, in stage uh, four. So some of the advantages I see with this thumb guard is um, it's 100% uh, safe. Uh, you can wash it and, and reuse it uh, uh, if you're taking it on and off, but you can actually leave it on as well. It's very uh, inexpensive and acceptable to parents. The initial pilot study, which was done uh, with Peter Dontist uh, in Ohio in Massachusetts, um, uh, they uh, showed that it was um, very successful, particularly in uh, kids who uh, were eager to stop and just needed some sort of reminder. Um, when they asked the parents what they thought of it, you can see very high success uh, rate in its ease of use and whether they'd recommend it to a colleague. So it became so popular that uh, he then developed something for kids who suck their fingers. And this is called a finger guard. And again, this can be placed on whatever finger it is that is being put in the mouth. Now, now I've been using these for the last 10 years and had very, very good success uh, uh, with them. So um, thumb guard appliance, uh, research done by Dr. Casamato, uh, published in uh, clinical research uh, by Gordon Christensen and uh, also in general pediatric uh, dentistry. I'll leave the references. If you want to have a copy, you could email me. I'm happy to forward them uh, to you. And as I said, it does not actually prevent the thumb going in, but it doesn't give them the comfort, so the kid, kid tends to give up. So when do I use this versus um, uh, a bandage on the elbow? Well, let's think about it. A kid who's doing this only when they're in bed, when they're about to fall asleep, put the bandage on, on the elbow, very inexpensive. A kid who's doing it more often, uh, use the thumb guard. 
a kid who's doing it and has already caused damage to the palate, such a crossbite, uh, you don't need the thumb guard because then you're going to place uh, expansion appliance. And the expansion appliance will not only physically break the habit, it will then correct the bite. So I have very specific criteria of what I do and when um, I, I do that. Um, this journal, the Journal of Clinical Orthorings, had a great issue August 2000 uh, where we had um, uh, a uh, professor of orthorings uh, from Paris, uh, Dr. Skinskaya, uh, talk about the habit and methods of breaking it. And uh, one thing I really like uh, from his article is in a really chronic thumb sucker, and you can see this little girl, not only does she have this huge open bite, um, but um, she had a secondary habit of rubbing her eyebrows. Uh, and as I said, I've seen all sorts of things uh, such as um, uh, loss of hair, skin infection, um, uh, deviated septums, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now in these kids, the thumb guard is just not going to be enough because what you're going to have to do here is go in and fix the problem that's already arisen. So what are the problems? Threefold. Narrow palate with cross bite, tongue thrust, and um, uh, lower lip uh, overactivity. So if you look at this girl's photograph, you can see all of those. Um, you see the open bite, you see the proclined incisors, you see the retroclined lower incisors. Um, now, if you have got that kid who is really only doing this at night time, if you don't like the thought of putting a, a bandage on the elbow, you could also do things like this, where in the kid's pajamas you have this little sort of sleeping bag and the kid um, is um, saying goodnight to the thumb, uh, putting it uh, in the thumb home and then going to sleep. But I find this is not as effective um, as the uh, bandage on the elbow and certainly not as effective as the thumb guard. And whatever you program or whatever method you use to break the habit, whether it's the um, thumb guard or just persuasion with diagrams, you want to reward the child. And the best way I found of rewarding the child is having a little booklet where the parent um, puts a sticker every time they've done the right thing and they bring that sticker in to me and I give them a little prize. If you want to go the next step above that, this was a software that was developed uh, by um, a uh, orthodontist, uh, Dr. Fred Fink. And uh, basically, it has a status screen where the child is asked, you know, did you suck the thumb or not? And the parent can help um, with that. And then it builds up a record, which the kid can then just download, print out, and bring in for their, their prize. So any of these reward mechanisms work uh, well, particularly for younger children. Uh, so this older child, um, we have to get a little bit more aggressive, and we are using a combination effect here of a fixed um, expansion appliance and tongue thrust retraining, and I'll come to one of those cases in a minute. So please understand, not every open bite is caused by thumb sucking. In fact, a great differential diagnosis between an anterior open bite um, uh, with tongue thrust only versus thumb sucking if your lower incisors are retroclined, and if that open bite is asymmetrical, that's obviously the thumb or finger because it's coming in on one side and it's causing that problem. If you have an open bite which is symmetrical right in the middle and both your upper and lower incisors are, are proclined, that's more than likely going to be purely that tongue thrust habit. So that kind of gives us some indication. So this boy, uh, obvious thumb sucker, the unilateral open bite, the retroclined lower incisors, and the dead giveaway, the little photo of the two thumbs uh, next to each other. So I want to sort of conclude this lecture with these great cases of a uh, um, great little kid who kind of our parents have tried everything um, to stop her from putting her fingers in her. And um, she had been doing it uh, for so long that uh, it was causing a severe class two problem. Uh, you can see the fingers were coming in uh, from the left side. You can see the open bite here. You can see the proconation of the upper incisors. Um, and uh, obviously, in swallowing, that tongue is going to sit in that position. There's the actual uh, culprit. And uh, as I said, take photos of this so that you know, uh, uh, you know sometimes um, later in treatment when you're finishing orthodontics and you see an open bite reappearing, you go, geez, well, why has this happened? You 
look back and you sort of ask the kid, are you sucking your thumb or fingers uh, again? Um, so here uh, we see in this young lady the uh, crossbite, um, the high uh, palatal uh, vault. This is the lower jaw, uh, which is not as badly affected, obviously, as the top jaw uh, because of where that uh, finger is lying and the uh, sucking habit. Um, so we've given her an appliance, which is called Hyrax. And this Hyrax is going to expand the jaw to eliminate the crossbite, make more room for the teeth. Um, but at the same time, the front of it has um, a deterrent, which if you look at it from the front is a little sharp spike. So that way, physically, the child can't um, put the uh, thumbs in. Uh, and then after expanding, you see how nice and broad this girl's uh, jaw is. We just put four little braces to basically detorque the proclined upper incisors, gather them together, get the center line on, make further the root, the eruption of permanent canines. And when we know that the habit stopped, we can just cut those um, sharp uh, barbs uh, away. So I'd like to leave you with this thought, which is supported by this paper. And that is, any child who sucks their thumb will, by default, have an open bite. And even if you stop the habit, you still have to deal with the open bite. Uh, and in this paper published in Angle Orthodontist uh, Year 2000, they, uh, Japanese research, they, they, they um, did a cinematographic study of where the tongue position is in these kids uh, who had open bites. And they kind of measured all the variables, position of the tongue, position of the teeth, septometric uh, data. And they came up um, with uh, these linear measurements uh, where they show uh, in the first diagram the contact of the tongue and the palate, then the front part of the uh, uh, dorsal part of the tongue, the middle part of the dorsal of the tongue, and finally the rear part of the dorsal of the tongue with the tongue tip. So we know in normal swallowing, tip of tongue behind the upper incisors, dorsal of the tongue hitting the um, mid palate, causing uh, the expansion of the arch to occur. So their conclusions were kids who had the anterior open bites also showed a tongue tip protrusion, uh, a slower movement of the rear part of the dorsal of the tongue, hence less development of the palate, and an earlier closure of the nasopharynx uh, compared with the controls. So their study suggests that patients with anterior open bites had to compensate the posture of the tongue. Uh, so what we now need to look at is how we're going to retrain the tongue. And I'm going to go through tongue thrust therapy and exercises in part three of this three-part seminar. But I work a lot with oral myologists and speech pathologists uh, to do that. This is probably one of the better intraoral appliances. This was developed by Dr. Tony Viazzi, uh, uh, orthodontist in Plano, uh, Texas. And what this appliance does is three things. It um, prevents the habit. It then uh, discourages the tongue going forward, but without trapping it in the wrong position. And finally, if you have a look um, how it um, curls behind the lower lip, it breaks that overactive mentalis pattern. Uh, so in a child who uh, is constantly sucking the thumb and um, has an open bite, has a tongue thrust, has a narrow palate, you can sort of um, uh, kill three birds with a stone. So to summarize, because we're on to the uh, time for questions and nearly one hour has passed, um, what do I, what would I like you to have learned from this lecture? Number one, that um, breastfeeding is important and breaking of the pacifier is important. If you can break the pacifier, well and good. If you can't, at least use a proper orthodontic pacifier. Um, number two is, uh, in this day and age, parents, particularly mothers, want to get back in the workforce. Um, uh, they are not breastfeeding uh, the children as long as they should, and the kid is getting a, um, a bottle. Uh, that bottle, like the pacifier, like the thumb, is encouraging wrong tongue posture and promoting an improper swallowing pattern. Call it a tip of tongue to lower lip uh, infantile swallowing pattern or tongue thrust, uh, as you may. Uh, to form that seal, the lower lip then becomes overactive. And that hyperactivity is causing a lot of lower incisor retrogression and crowding. So if we can break these habits early, uh, we have a better chance of the permanent dentition erupting to where it should, less need for extraction of teeth, and less need for more uh, extensive uh, orthodontics. 
So once again, uh, I'm happy to take questions, but if we don't get around to all the questions or if you have a specific case you'd like to show me, you can just upload the records to my email address, which I've left up here, info at uh, DerekMahoney.com. And fitting of the farm gun, uh, use of the um, HINS uh, pacifier, uh, fitting of a fixed expander, all of these things can be found on YouTube uh, as part of my ongoing education program in orthodontics. And uh, with that, uh, Jennifer, I'm happy uh, to take uh, any questions.